Yo, it's Afrojack. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how I created one, two, three, and the special techniques that I used to achieve that particular Afrojack sound. So let's dive right into it. So yeah, then the synthesizer is on the drop. I have one rule. It's like if it doesn't sound fat with two or three synths, you just gotta play something else. I see a lot of new producers, they use like 20 layers or something. Like I'm sure that it'll work, but a lot of plugins have presets built in that already have so many layers. And yes, it might sound fatter, but I think it should already be working with this. And that's what I tried here. So this is, uh, it's two synths. That's the bass. And then the synth is one very simple, one of my favorites of all time, uh, 3X Osk. The original FL Studio plugin. And then in this one, and it's actually interesting because I didn't find this out until I opened the project again. I used uh, cloning, so I cloned the synthesizer and I changed the LFO in all the synthesizers. So when you hear it playing, I don't know if you heard it in the record already, but here. That's just four different LFOs playing from four different synthesizers. That's the good thing about using FL native uh, instruments. You can load, you could clone a thousand of them and it will not take up that much CPU space. And of course it's one saw, so it's not that complicated. So if you look at it in the piano roll, everything is playing a different segment. Yeah, that's fun. So you can just mess with it. It's actually easier than just making one automation for that. Also, especially because it's very difficult, I think, to switch between an automation that goes uh, four by four or two triplets. So I just pulled up uh, another record because I wanted to show some tiny mixing things. I'll play the full thing first, instrumentally. As you might notice, I was changing the volume of the main synth, and to me, like getting the volumes right is just about listening again and again and again, and every time you reopen it, you're like, ah. And you have to AB with other records. And also a very, very important thing for all young producers out there, always split your sub and your main bass. Because it's very difficult to get a sub, how you say, a, a bass synth that also happens to have perfect low end. And end of the day, that can make a very big difference. And a lot of times, actually, it's interesting. I know a lot of producers, they just use a regular sine wave as a sub bass. Still with some high pass filtering, but uh, see you here. A fruity stereo enhancer to make it mono. That's how we do it. We use a stereo enhancer to make things mono. Yeah, that's another thing I want to tell you about chords. When you think you need more synthesizers to get your chords fatter. I didn't learn about uh, SUS2 and 7th things until about two or three years ago. 
And then that really changed the sound of my chords. And it's very weird because sometimes you're going to have two notes next to each other, like right next to each other. When in the beginning, when you learn piano, it's like everything should always be spread out. So like, for example, here is a... Basically, there is a, a B and a A next to each other in one chord. Or the, even there's a bass, probably. There's a G in a D, G, D, no, there's, that's right. So this one. E in a D. Yeah, so this is interesting. This is, the bass note is actually one above the bottom note of the chord. And when you start learning that, you start learning how to create fat chords without needing multiple plugins. Eventually, this is... It's pretty basic, but you can find it on YouTube. I'm not a pianist, so... So that's just two basses, one sound and one for sub. And then there's two chords. Yeah, by the way, it took me a long time to find one that was like perfect, not too much future house, but also not too gritty. Or two chord synths. Ah, oh, this is actually very interesting, this trick that I use. This is my, uh, one of my favorites. I take out a lot of high out of my synthesizers because I always want the, the percussion and the drums and the hi-hats, they control the groove. So I want to give them space. So I always take a little bit of top high out of my synthesizers. And sometimes to add some grittiness to the bass, I give the bass some more high. Actually, I don't know if I did it here, but let's see. No. Easy. Also interesting to note, I sampled my own sub bass. So in the sub, it's very boring in the sub. But do notice how I take out the accents to give it a little bit more breathing space when you hear the pound. So straight and then it's a short one. That's pretty easy for this soft synth. Unless you start messing with it and you do this. I like to make it feel alive and like developing. So in the second drop, this saw just goes completely crazy. Well, as you can hear, like even if I mute almost everything, but you can always hear the accents. And that's what I think makes the record come alive. Here it is. Here's the, here's the compressor, actually. There you go. So, if you compress right, like, again, this is a trick. I use a saw and some noise. And basically what the compressor does is every time the saw is, how you say, not hitting, this, the the white noise comes up. So it automatically creates a tuck, tuck, it, they shift. And that happens super fast. And that's when you get the, that effect. And then there's also equalizer before the compressor to make sure no low end is going in. 
because mm. else the saw is too loud and the white noise cannot push through. And then another equalizer after the compressor, because the compressor will always bring in some low end that you try to cut out with the equalizer. And then there's this little dip because... And then there's like a distorted saw on top to just... I always put my reverb on the synth because I like to compress the reverb. So one of like my old, old school tricks, which I always use, is when you have a sample that goes, ah, it stops. If you put a compressor on it, it still stops. If you put a reverb on it and then you compress it with the reverb, it sounds like the reverb is built into the actual sample. Okay, so that's like very hard. But now what's interesting, If I put a different note, it cuts off the reverb from the before note. So you get like a very change, a very big change in dimension. It's a very, I think I learned the trick from uh, listening to Benny Benassi's Satisfaction where he does the same type of thing, where like the synth hits and then it gets cut off and hits again. And it's like a mix of sidechain and reverb sidechain in, in the own sound. And that to me always gave like a pumping effect. No compressor, compressor. I always want to find a way to progress a certain melody into a song. So if you if you would have this, like how I produce is, I copy paste it and put a chord progression under it just to see how it feels. And so on and so on. That's how I usually produce. Yeah, so basically anything you put through the, the compressor set on maximum or like brick wall limiter, doesn't matter what you use, it will amplify something that usually would go disappearing because of volume lag. So the tail end that goes, gets cut off, of course, gets lost. It's a pretty basic trick, but I, I always use it. And then sometimes also when I'm producing, I consolidate. Well, actually, I'll show you. Why not? No synthesizer could ever reproduce this because the reverb cuts off and comes back in. Then you have open reverb of a closed synth. So yeah, to me, that's, uh, that's interesting to play with. Yeah, so like this, the combination of side chaining and cutting things weird will make it uh, very interesting. But I That's the same example, but then with the vocal. So there's the reverb, compression, and editing. Well, I start with the first thing that I learned. So grouping my stuff. One of the things I learned to do is to group my stuff so I can easily listen to tiny errors. To put your things in order, so you can always look back what's where. So here I have FX. Yeah, here it is. There's a lot going on there. Yeah, so same effect here, but...
So the interesting thing, like for me, uh, like I said, I group everything now so I can listen to everything in the same way, but I want the record to already say like what the melody is saying just through through ethics and beats. So the accenting, the, I call it accenting, it should play along with the synthesizer. So if it's right, So uh, what, what you can hear in my, in my records, and I started doing this, I think like seven years ago or something, I don't remember where I heard it first, but by accenting, you can change energy. And people only have certain amounts of energy on the dance floor to give. So if that, dun, 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 this little thingy, if I would continue it, there would be no space for breathing. So by taking it out, even though the synthesizer is still very out there, the, the main synths. It gives it a little bit more space for that other thing to sound extra powerful. So by putting in accents or taking out accents at certain places, it gives the other, uh, the other sound space to shine, basically. That's like a tiny accent. I do these tiny accents to like, how can I amplify the second part so it still sounds like it's a living and breathing thing and not be too much out there. So that's the only difference between the first 15 seconds and the second 15 is this. It takes no space at all. It just gives you a signature like, yo, we're still moving. We're still going somewhere. And I think that's a necessity to keep it interesting at, instead of just having a repetition with an extra hi-hat. Of course, also, if you listen to the drums, you will notice that here is an extra hi-hat that comes in for the second part. And the AAA. Always things to build it up. But yeah, if you put it all together, you will hear a difference between here and here. By the way, notice the... Woo! What I think is interesting is like, instead of looking at a production as uh, one production, try thinking about it as a band. Like when you have a band, it's not like the saxophonist, the guitarist, the trumpetist, everyone is playing something at the same time. It's like they interchange. So when you have like you hear it, like here's the accent of the, let me see if I can just have the, yeah. So it switches between the, the horn step with a reverb to a short horn step with a woo. Of course, you can speed this up if you want. And then here one more. That's another thing. This is very, very, very important. I always tell everyone I'm working with is like, don't silence the pre-drop because I know we're already having the rhythm in our head, but people need a sound or anything to signify rhythm. It's 
a tiny thing, but there's something that gives you the the rhythm. And like that's the thing with these type of records. And I notice also when I'm preparing for live shows, I'm playing a lot of records from other people. I always edit them because I notice like you need a groove here or you need extra accent here or like something to tell the people what's going on. One very important thing to note is that everything is cut off exactly. This is one of the things like when teaching uh, younger producers when they're producing, a lot of times I see things overlapping like this. That's a big one, but sometimes it's a tiny one and it's like the most terrible thing you can do because that, that will make your record lose impact. So again, like I like to make records feel alive, especially in the second drop. So there's this going on. Simple pitch, pitch thing. You can barely hear that it keeps filtering because there's a different synth playing over it. So because this plays over it, you're probably not even going to hear that the background is filtered. And mind you, when you're like doing this old school EDM snare, it's not just the EDM snare. There's like a lot of things going on there. So you have this. There's also an extra impact, and I think there's also a reverb extra, that's a double. So there's an extra accent in there, and then there's... Which to me is like maybe the most important one of all. Because it helps give more impact to the next one. Basically, every record that I do, there's that going on in the background. So even if you would mute the... And then another trick is don't sidechain everything. And if you don't sidechain things, don't put them too loud. But have it like in the background, but it gives like a new dimension to the record. Instead of having everything sidechained, it just gets boring after all. This is terrible what I did here. It worked for this record. But you have to... You have to remember that even though FL Studio is great, when the equalizer says that's happening, it's not actually happening. There's a lot of resonance always. No one has been able to perfectly make a cutoff, right? Software developer guys. There's always some resonance. So you should never do this. I actually, I should fix this before I put out this record or I leave it to the mastering guy. But generally, this will look like, ah, oh, that's exactly where I want the frequencies to be. But if you put a different equalizer under it, it, it will show you this did not happen. I can actually show you right now. So. so technically, there's not supposed to be any 30 hertz. But here, you can see very clearly, it's still very much alive in this area. Then another interesting thing, by the way, the first part of this entire thing that I was going through, we were listening to it without anything on the master. I accidentally had it off when I opened the project. So if it sounds like this. I feel it already sounds pretty mixed together. And that's without any mastering or compression. And that's usually now when I produce what I do. So I put one limiter on the master and everything else basically should happen in mix. Sometimes I use EQ to give it a little bump on the high end to emulate how it would sound after mastered. I 
a lot of people I know think they know what they're doing, but they don't really know what they're doing. So they put a stereo enhancer on it and then they expect like, yeah, in the studio it sounds so wide and then you play it live and it doesn't hit. Well, that's like probably because you did something wrong with your stereo. So don't get to stereo enhancers and stuff. Like if, if you have the right sound or if you have the right melody, the right mix, it will hit without stereo enhancers. So one very important thing which I like to do is when I listen to these types of records, I try to turn off the, the main lead and listen to how it sounds without. And then you can really work on getting it tight. Yeah, so that's, that's how I made it after working on it for a while. That's how it was originally. I worked on this record together with Chesner. So what I did, Everything needs to be tight. So this already, just that side chain, the white noise, everything needs to, how you say, flow perfectly. You can also use crowd noise as white noise. Most important thing to realize is if you're not a composer, if you don't know how to play the piano or guitar, find MIDI files, find other MIDI files. No one cares. Like when I listen to a record, it's like, oh, did you make that? Or did you get it from a sample pack? Like, no one cares. A festival is like, wow, great music. Unfortunately, it's from a sample pack, so I will not dance. It's like, no, this does not happen. So use sample packs, use MIDI, use whatever you can find to give yourself a head start, basically. I think a lot of people don't realize that nine out of 10 successful producers do not do everything themselves. I actually, in most projects, do everything myself, but also uh, Hero, we did, uh, I say I didn't write the lyrics, the lyrics were already there. It was a songwriter, so Ellie Goulding, Ryan Tedder, Jamie Scott, so pretty serious. Production was done like 70% by Dubvision like the actual engineering of the beat 10 feet tall rabel the singer actually wrote the chords i did not write those chords i did a lot of tracks myself uh, rock the house this one uh this record i did together with chesner but most of the time when you're like wow i love this david Guetta song or i love this tiesto song or i love this armin van buren song it's not like these guys are in the studio by themselves for 16 hours doing everything. So don't feel bad if you can't do it by yourself. And also don't feel bad about getting help because no one expecting you to do it by yourself. No one's caring about like, wow, did you do that all by yourself? So to, to frame it, don't be afraid to use help. And don't feel bad when what you make isn't as great as what other people use teams for. Teams of people with 20 years of experience, like it's not fair. I always think that like a big, 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 big part of all this stuff can be learned. And I think it starts with understanding your mentality. It's not necessarily about your skill set, it's about your mentality about your skill set. Are you willing to learn new things or are you willing to adapt to a successful method or are you going to be a cool creative? Which is also cool. I'm not a cool creative. Like There's many cool creatives out there, but there's a smaller chance of getting the life that you want from this industry, you know? Like for me, I wanted to be part of nightlife. I wanted to be part of music. I love making music. I love doing things. And in order to get that, I needed to work a certain way. I needed to work efficiently. And now that I've been working efficiently, it's a lot more fun than just making a thousand records and one accidentally working because I accidentally had the clap and the kick and the right level. Everyone has a story to tell, but try to speak the same language as the people you're trying to tell the story. 
That's the easiest way I can say it. So all that adds to making a record. That's how I work at least. You don't have to listen to anything I said. I'm just one guy using FL Studio. So.